Um, with, I'm really excited to announce that the um, Mountains to Sound in Maritime Washington National Heritage Areas management plans were both recently approved. Yay. Um, and, and that clears the way for them really to do some great work and also get more funding to do that great work. So why don't we start? Um, both of our heritage areas in Washington state are going to present kind of jointly and then Aaron Barth will be joining us from Northern Plains to talk about some of the work that they've been doing with tribal engagement and partnerships. And um, Aaron actually told me not to use the word engagement, that that sounded like a military exercise. So as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, mm, not the word I was supposed to use. But um, words matter and, and those things are important. So um, Alex, John, Chris, I don't know who's gonna go first. So I leave that to you. Well, um, I'll, I'll maybe, well, Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? We're going to tag team is the short version of it. I'll, I'll do some introduction stuff. And then Alex is going to present about Maritime's process. And then I'll present about Greenway's process. And y'all can ask questions wherever you want to. Um, but Alex, do you want to introduce yourself first? And then I'll get going. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm Alex Gradwell. I'm the incoming program director for Maritime Washington and excited to be chatting with you guys about uh, some things we've learned, some things we've done well, some things we didn't do so well on and have been learning from. So yeah, thanks, John. Great. And I'm John Hookster and I'm the executive director of the Mountains to Sound Greenway National Heritage Area, also in Washington. And same thing, really excited to have this chance to share a little bit and and I want to start by saying thank you to other NHAs um, who gave us advice early on Aaron was one of them um, when we were when we were starting our management planning process and trying to figure out how do we work well with tribes um, it was really helpful to be able to lean on other NHAs experiences and advice so um uh, Alex and I have some slides and I'll just I'll be the slide sharer um and, and what we wanted to do um, to start, sorry, I can't do two things that can't talk and Zoom share at one time. Um, we wanted to start with just a little bit of introductory context to share with you all about tribes in Washington state, really in the Pacific Northwest more generally that um, for me personally, until I started to really understand what I'm going to show you in these first three tribes, we were really struggling to with how to how to work with tribes and kind of understand what they were asking of us and um, and and how to work together. So um, we thought we would, uh, and this I think applies also to Maritimes. So we thought we would just share this jointly. So um, kind of three points to, to try to impress upon everybody. One is this, this is a map, and I'll say this is not pers my favorite personal map, but it's illustrative of, of how different native bands um, used the landscape, occupied the landscape. They're kind of their traditional territories before European and American settlers started to arrive. So you know, and that was that was only 170 years ago. Um, so you know, within the last couple couple hundred years ago, the landscape would have been this um, overlapping mosaic of tribal territories of different tribal groups um, who were interconnected through language, through culture, through trade, um, but they occupied and traveled across and used the entire landscape. Um, when um come on slides let's go uh <clears throat> when washington territory when the washington territory was established um one of the first that maybe the first governor was isaac stevens and he was charged by the u.s government to go out and treaty with the tribes and so in 1854 and 1855 he negotiated and i'll do air quotes um negotiated a series of treaties with native peoples in the territory. And this map shows the areas covered by those various treaties. So each color is a different treaty. Um, and, and these treaties were negotiated to essentially get native people to cede and leave the land. And in return for ceding their territory um, and kind of all the territories that aren't in bright yellow, um, something really, really important 
was included in those treaties. And the, I put the language here on the screen, the right of taking fish at all usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians in common with the citizens of the territory together with the privilege of hunting, gathering roots and berries and pasturing the horses upon open and unclaimed lands. Um, these were really important promises uh, that were made by the US government to tribes in the state of Washington who ceded their territory, most of them ceded their territory, um, and moved to reservations where they did not have the, the land base, they didn't have the resource base. And so these promises to be able to still go off reservation to, to fish, hunt, and gather um, were super important. And, um, you know, now in the, in the 60s, then the fish wars were famously fought right in the heart of what is now the maritime NHA and, and the coastal boundary of the Greenway NHA to, um, to validate the fishing rights. So in the state of Washington, tribes are co-managers. They own 50% of the fish and they co-manage those stocks with the state. So it's really, really important um, thing about tribes in the Northwest. Um, they retained rights through treaties made with the US government that as sovereign nations today, they vigorously defend and uphold because they are um, part and parcel with their culture and kind of their present day um, economic activity. And um, I just can't say enough about how important it is to tribes. Um, one more introductory slide, and I'm gonna turn it over to Alex about what that meant for us. Um, this then is, um, it, so if you think back to that first that first slide, when the whole landscape, tribes were using the whole landscape and different tribal groups had different territories with some overlap and the like. Today in Washington state, there are 29 federally recognized tribes. There are a number of tribes that are not federally recognized as well. 24 of those 29 federally recognized tribes are also treaty tribes. And so they retain specific rights to fish, hunt, and gather off reservation. And that is a really unique situation for tribes. I think there might be 40 some treaty tribes total, um, but they're all in the Pacific Northwest. And it's just very, very different from other parts of the country where, where tribes really were um, did not get to keep uh, rights off reservation. So um, this is a really important context within which Maritime NHA has engaged with tribes and within which the Greenway is engaged with tribes. So we wanted to share that um, as opening context. And with that, I will be slide turner for Alex. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, just seconding what John said, this was a real learning experience for me as well, um, learning about you know what makes what makes tribes in the Northwest unique, like what their unique rights are and, and how important those are when you're engaging with, with tribes and with tribal members is to really, you know, have a deep understanding, ask a lot of questions and make sure that, you know, you are respecting their rights that they have fought so hard to retain. So John, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of how we approach collaboration with tribes throughout the man management planning period and our plans for moving forward because while well, we have a lot in common with the Mountains to Sound Greenway, um, we also had some, some more unique, um, unique issues and approaches to deal with. Next slide. Um, so I think the first thing I just wanna emphasize is how um, important tribal heritage is to maritime heritage. So in Washington state, so, we did as our part of our plan management planning. We did it all almost all virtually. So we did a lot of virtual surveys, Zoom surveys, and one thing we always asked folks at the beginning of a meeting was, "What makes Washington's maritime heritage unique?" Um, and you'll see here that far and away the most popular answer to that question was Native heritage, uh, more than the weather, which was surprising to me. I thought it was going to be the weather, uh, but tribal presence is really strong in Washington, and that it, and it's very very strongly recognized kind of within the public understanding of like what does make this area so, so special. So next slide. So the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area includes most of the shoreline of Washington state. Um, it includes the lands of 18 federally recognized tribes. Um, and I we do have there, it says, or 21, because like John said, um, there are, 
many treaty tribes that do retain rights to their usual and accustomed grounds and station for fishing, gathering, collecting shellfish. Um, and so while there's 18 tribes who have land that is in the NHA, there's three additional that also retain um, a usual and accustomed rights to, to that land. And we were really lucky to get to work with many of these tribes in creating the management plan. Next slide. So the first place that we started out was with kind of formal, formal outreach to tribal chairs and tribal councils. So each of these tribes is a sovereign nation. Um, they have their own tribal chairs, they have their own elections, they have their own councils. Um, and so we really approached each of them individually um, as a sovereign nation. Um, I'm not gonna read everything we did here, but I do just wanna highlight something that was really helpful for us, which was key individual interviews. So before we started our outreach, we identified, I think, 30 to 30 to 40 individuals um, across all different sectors and all different um, geographies to kind of help us with our outreach planning. Um, and we spoke with a few tribal leaders that were already kind of in our sphere as part of that and got advice about how to best work with individual tribes. And that was truly some of the most helpful advice that we received throughout all of this planning. Um, and then those those folks that we spoke to that were giving us advice, giving us connections, um, they ended up helping us issue invitations to a kind of a kickoff meeting. Um, they helped make introductions um, and they helped us identify like who were the best folks to be involved from each tribe um, because each tribe is organized differently. Um, they're cultural resource folks, they're heritage folks, they might be in different departments. Um, and so it's really helpful to have, you know, folks that can make those introductions for you. Next slide. Um, and then the other thing that we did that I think was really helpful is we had a, a pretty informal tribal working group that met regularly um, throughout our management planning period for a, about a year. Um, it included 17 members um, who represented 11 of the 18 federally recognized tribes. And we also had a couple of folks from IANTA, which is the American Indian Alaska Native Tourism, I think it's association, not alliance um, and if you haven't been involved with them yet, I would highly recommend it. They were super helpful, um, really plugged in, again, helped us make some introductions and get folks on board. Um, so not all tribes sent members to the tribal working group and that's fine. Um, some tribes in our heritage area are more focused on heritage and on external messaging and education than others are. Um, also, it was a pandemic. They had their own things to be worried about. Um, so our, our kind of guiding star throughout this was to be pleasantly persistent. So if we're not hearing back, we're going to keep issuing invitations. Um, we're going to, you know, make sure to keep folks in the loop. And then, you know, we had people engage, you know, two and a half years in. that was like, hey, we saw your emails. We haven't had time to do this, but now we're interested in getting involved. So that was very helpful for us. Um, we also had some tribes that just didn't feel like, didn't want to join the tribal working group for one reason or another. And we just had individual meetings with them as well. So I think really meeting folks, um, engaging with folks in the way that they they dictate the terms was pretty important for us um, because that really helped us build relationships, build trust, which is really the, the goal of this. So the tribal working group um, helped us revise all elements of the plan. And um, we had a couple members of that who were particularly helpful in like literally going through our management plan with a red pen, which was amazing. Um, but in general, the tribal working group really advised on, you know, how we're going to work together moving forward. They advised on the interpretive plan and on the branding specifically. Um, so one thing I always like to point out here on the left side of the screen, you'll see our logo. Um, and in between the mountains and the sea, you'll see kind of hidden in there is a traditional Coast Salish canoe. That was actually designed for us by um, one of our tribal working group members, Philip Red Eagle, who is also an artist and a canoe carver. Um, and so we were really thrilled to kind of include that in, in our logo as part of our um, forward face of the heritage area. Next slide. So one big thing that we asked that tribal working group was what maritime stories and resources do you have that you would like more people to know about? Um, and how can we help amplify what you already have um, and what you would like to share? We tried to be very conscious of the fact that there's lots of resources that are not meant for the public. They're private to the tribes and they do not want them to be shared. Um, and so we really let the tribal working group and the different tribes lead the way and kind of what they wanted us to highlight. 
because many tribes have these amazing resources already that just need more light shed on them. Um, so the example I have here is from the Samish tribe. They've put together this series of story maps with traditional Coast Salish place names. <laughs> Super interesting and no, like not enough people know about this. So we've just been, you know, working with them to figure out how we can share that more widely. Next slide. Um, and then the other main thing that we asked folks was how do you want to work together moving forward? Um, and it was determined kind of by the end of this planning period that this had been a, a helpful group, um, a nice group, a good way to come together and have two-way communication between tribal councils and the heritage area. Um, and so we did decide to keep this tribal working group going. We actually just kind of put together the a new, new outline for that and sent out invitations earlier this month um, and are kind of a, assembling a group for that. So this new tribal working group um, is gonna meet every other month. Um, we really are trying to make this not a huge burden on tribal employees who are already pretty overworked, um, but they're gonna help generally provide advice and guidance, continue serving as that communications bridge, identifying more resources. Um, and then we're also gonna be working together to create a tribal guide to the Maritime Washington region. That's still kind of in the works exactly what that's gonna look like. Um, but it's the idea is that it is a forward facing product, probably web-based um, where we identify sites where the public can go to learn more about tribal maritime heritage. And it'll include stories and information that's all written and curated by the tribes um, to help give folks a basic introduction. We're kind of modeling this off of IANTA's American Indians in Route 66. I'll put a link for that in the chat if you haven't seen it yet. It's a great resource. Um, but in general, we're just, it is very, we found that it's very helpful to kind of have a standing group of people that you can go to with questions that understand what your heritage area is doing um, and can really prove as a, as a sounding board and as that communications bridge to different tribal councils because obviously maintaining relationships with 21 different tribes is a little time consuming. So this has proved very helpful for us. And that is all I had, John. So if you wanna take it over and talk a little bit about Mountains to Sound, I know you guys had some some different approaches to tribal engagement as well. Yeah, th thanks, Alex. And um, and maybe I'll I'll maybe go through my few slides here, and then and then we can open up for questions. Um, so uh, I wanted to start. So just a little bit of orientation to the Mountains to Sound Greenway National Heritage Area. Um, we start in Seattle along Puget Sound, so we we have an overlap with Maritime NHA, and then our heritage area spans about 100 miles along the Interstate 90 corridor um, from Seattle to the community of Ellensburg, um, and it and crosses the Cascade Mountains. <clears throat> and um, I'll maybe add uh, something as you look at this um, again, thinking back to the kind of the context of of tribes on this landscape. Um, this would have been, you know, part of that mosaic I showed you in the first one, but the center of our heritage area, Snoqualmie Pass, was a bit of a, a cultural boundary um, between the Coast Coast Salish peoples to the west and interior Salish, there's a Hapton people to the east. So, um, but who, who traded um, and traveled back and forth across that pass a lot. But we have a little bit of a cultural boundary. Um, there was also that that pass was also a boundary between a couple of those treaties. And so the modern day tribal governments that were created by treaties sort of have a natural there's there are two governments to the east and there are three governments to the west. Um, but um, in that European mindset of straight line boundaries that are mutually exclusive of one another, um, didn't match the traditional kind of indigenous way of using the land where there was a lot of blurry and overlapping boundaries. And so we have a dynamic where the heritage area is the traditional territory of, there are five different tribes, um, all who, whom have traditional territory and some of whom share it because before the treaties forced native people off the land, um, a tribal group like the Snoqualmie people got split. They got sent, some of them got sent to one reservation, some got sent to another, and they're now part of different tribal governments. This has happened to a lot of tribes. This is, a, this is true in a lot of tribes in Washington, um, but it's a complexity where there might be um, shared ancestry, but now they are kind of segregated into different sovereign governments, and there are 
issues that that creates, um, some of which I'll share with you. So um, let me go to my next slide. Um, one of the things that was different about the Greenway Heritage Area is um, this block of text was included in our designating legislation. So we were part of the Dingle Act. We were designated with five other NHAs, including Maritime. We all kind of had the same instructions, if you will, but we had this little extra bit added in. Um, and and you, you're welcome to read it while I'm talking. In short, it it specifically identifies, um, charges us to develop our plan, both the, ma the management plan and specifically the interpretive plan to include tribal heritage. Um, we were responsible for doing it in a way that was consistent with trust responsibilities of the federal government and the treaty rights that um, the tribes hold. Um, and it was to be done in consultation with, with five specific tribes, the Snoqualmie, the Tulalip, the Yakima, um, the Muckleshoot and the Colville. Um, and so we, we kind of had this little bit of an elevated bar. Um, Maritime had 21 tribes that they needed to engage with, um, but they didn't have quite as explicit a mandate. And so we, we kind of took this really seriously. Um, like Maritime, we began by, by reaching out. We, we wrote letters to each of the tribal councils um, to say we've been designated a national heritage area. We have this charge. We'd like to we'd like to talk and understand how to work together. Um, but we were in some really different starting places. We had the the Greenway Trust as the coordinating entity. We have a we had a track record of fairly transactional relationships with the Snoqualmie tribe. Um, we had some long ago, but kind of discontinued um, interact transactional relationships with the Muckleshoot. We had some limited interactions with the Yakima. We didn't know that we didn't even know the Colville had traditional territory in our heritage area. Um, and, and we really in the same with Tulalip because their reservation is well out of the heritage area. But the people in the that that sent to the Tulalip tribes are from our heritage area. So we were kind of in a different relationship spot with each tribe. And so not surprisingly, we got um, reactions from some and no responses from others, which was a little you know, confusing to us. We didn't know what to do with it. Um, notably, I'll say the Tulalip tribes, we didn't know them well, but they had actively lobbied against the designation of our heritage area. Um, but once it was designated, when we reached out and said, we want to talk, you know, we want to talk and work with you because we have this obligation and we want to fulfill it. They said, great, let's talk. And um, the, so the Tulalip leaned in early on and, um, and we established a regular meeting schedule with them um, and they were very active participants. So it was interesting to go from having them be opposed to our designation to being willing to work with us and through our planning process, building up a, a, a pretty decent relationship, good communications, and, um, and they were really constructive in helping us shape things. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, oh, in terms of how we approach things, um, like Maritime, we wrote a lot of letters at the beginning, and um, but we were kind of stymied. We also, early in our planning process, we kind of unwittingly walked into some of this kind of cultural tension that got embedded into the region when the US government forced tribes to sort of adopt a different governance style um, and push them off the land and separated groups. Um, there are, what we have learned is there are tensions between some tribes that stems in part from their having a shared history on similar spots on the landscape. And so they have a shared interest, but they are separate governments. And um, we unwittingly walked into some of that um, tension in a way that that really damaged um, our very um, young and fragile relationships with a couple of those tribes. And it took us a lot of time and a lot of effort to repair that. Um, and that's that's why those first three slides are you know kind of scored into my brain to to remember how and why our tribes tribal governments, who they are, where they are, what they are today, um, and who are the people that comprise those, those tribes comprise, and, and what are their shared histories, and what are some of the consequences of the, of those treaties tearing all that apart. So, um, 
go to my next slide here. Um, <clears throat> So after we had, I would say we had a rocky start, um, but on the advice of a couple of the tribes, um, we retained a tribal liaison, and it was the single best thing we did for our tribal engagement. Um, we hired somebody who had been, um, he's a tribal member of, of a tribe um, elsewhere in the region, but his entire career was spent working with um, all the treaty tribes. He he was um, he was the right hand of Billy Frank Jr., who was one of the principal leaders of the fish wars and the establishment of the of fishing rights for tribes in the state. And um, and so our liaison had a, a was steeped in intertribal um, dynamics, and as a tribal member, understood um, protocol and tradition um, in a way that we still can't. Um, and, and he had a network of relationships that he was able to, to help um, help us make connection with tribes who we didn't know at all. And we're never, ever going to respond to some random email from some guy in Seattle that they never met. So um, it was really helpful to have somebody that already knew um, people in the different tribal governments, knew how to work with different tribal governments, understood some of their unique characters and dynamics um, and was able to help us navigate. And, and so one of the things, one of the big things we did because we really made a commitment to center our interpretive plan and our, our whole um, thematic framework on tribal heritage. And so um, Bob helped us work with tribes. He worked with each of the five tribes and gathered their input and helped shape. And again, I'm not going to read all these words, but I invite you to read um, if you're interested. This is our tribal heritage theme, the eyes, voices, and teachings of the first people of these lands impart understanding of the heritage area from time immemorial to the present day. Um, and then several narratives, topics that we'll be kind of developing and interpreting and amplifying um, through our, our NHA implementation plan. Um, these were really developed um, with a strong hand and authorship um, by the tribes and, and we embraced them. And this really, um, it was a really powerful um, anchor point for our plan. So all the other themes also sort of connect back and interconnect with these things. But um, our tribal liaison was essential for helping um, that happened. And in the course of doing this was how we um, really use these as vehicles to begin building relationships um, with the tribes, you know, appropriate point of contact, helping them understand what is this NHA about? Um, how are we trying to work with them? And, and now hopefully as we start, as now that we're approved, we start looking at implementation. Um, like maritime, we've we've really spent a lot of time now talking with the tribes about well, how are we going to having centered tribal heritage and sort of given them voice to say what is it about tribal heritage that they want the wider American public to learn about and understand? Um, we now are focusing on well, how do, how do we work together? You know, how often do we want to meet? How do we co-create things together, et cetera? So, um, I feel like we're still very early on our learning curve, um, but I'm also really um, happy to feel like we've made it off the we've made it off the flat starting point, and and we're starting to climb something, and we've been able to do some um, some nice projects. So I'll leave I'll leave the words behind and. This is a picture of, of Snoqualmie Falls and behind it, Mount Sai. Um, and what I see in this picture, what I hope you can appreciate in this picture is this sort of embodies the promise and the challenge of our heritage area where Snoqualmie Falls and Mount Sai are both sacred, sacred sites for Snoqualmie people who today are part of the Snoqualmie tribe and the Tlalip tribes. Um, Snoqualmie Falls is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the state. It was um, developed for hydropower uh, over a century ago. So it's, it's a spot that has a complicated history of both being sacred and being desecrated and, um, and the tribe really um, trying hard to protect that site. Mount Sai is also a sacred site and it's one of the most popular hiking destinations for the Seattle metro area. Um, 
literally tens of thousands of people up there every year. And so how do we in our heritage area, how do we work with tribes to, to honor and elevate their heritage and also help to protect these places, not just well, there, there is a kind of a recreating and a visiting public that wants to see and learn about these places and they are sacred places that need to be protected. And I think that's both the challenge and the promise that we have in the Greenway NHA. So, um, that's it for me. And if we have a few minutes, I think Alex and I would be happy to answer questions people might have. I think we'll have Aaron Barth share from Northern Plains first and then we'll take questions. Sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you, it was excellent. Hi, Aaron. You're muted. Right. Okay, am I, am I better, am I audible now? You're wonderful. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, let's see, I've got just a quick map that for orientation purposes. Do I have the ability to um, screen share just to? Yep, at the bottom it's green, it says okay. share screen. Here we go, okay. Okay, let's see, I will, well, it looks like I have to open the PDF for it to be able to screen share here. And while Aaron's getting set up too, if folks wanna put a question in the chat, so we have it, because sometimes I know when I have it in my mind and if I don't chat it right away, I forget. Or if anybody wants to shout out any questions. There we go. Oh, and Aaron's ready. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hooray. So this is, um, I'm so grateful this is being recorded because this is a beta version of our map, but um, <laughs> that's okay too. Um, I want to just get this up here because it helps with orientation as far as, as good as I am with all my words and narrative, right? It's nothing's, uh, nothing can beat an illustration, a really thoughtfully put together illustration, but I was just, um, We've got just a few quick notes here on uh, Northern Plains and tribal relations. And I think just some quick background on myself. And, um, you know, before I came to the National Heritage Area Program, I spent over a decade working on the Northern Plains and in both Dakotas and Montana, Minnesota, um, in cultural resource management, which is, the, of course, the historic preservation section 106 process. And from that, you know, over a decade of that, I've watch and learn um, through that, that oftentimes, or maybe it's all the time that the section 106 process, and even a lot of that includes, you know, tribal consultation. Um, a lot of that process is a engineering afterthought in projects. And um, I don't, you know, a lot of that, we wouldn't have control over the sequence of that in the section 106 process. But I thought, well, now that I'm oversee the National Heritage Area, Northern Plains National Heritage Area, um, what are ways that, you know, in this, uh, this position that I'm in now, can we, you know, and, and I'm just thinking, narrating how I was thinking out loud, how do we engage, uh, or not engage, but uh, outreach to tribal citizens, right? And even, even the the whole idea of are they you know would we refer to tribal relations tribal members tribal citizens um a good i would call him a good friend of mine justin deegan who uh is a tribal citizen of the uh mandan hadats and arikara nation or what the federal government uh still recognizes at the as the fort berthold indian reservation um justin deegan had told me that tribal citizen is preferred because citizen rather than member because citizen is uh, uh, denotes that active engagement um, agency, that sort of thing, right? So um, I guess it's just much of what um, all the other presentations have alluded to here. It's just a lot of this is just is listening, right? Just sitting down and listening. Um, I, I'll just do one case study, I guess, of what um, one, I don't know if you call it a success story, but it's certainly an outreach story uh, from 2019, uh, what Northern Plains did. And that was at the busiest state park in North Dakota is Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park. And on this map, uh, I think it's denoted as a circular, 22 as a circle is Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park. And um, 
and again, like a lot of these state parks and national parks that are throughout every heritage area, uh, not just in the American West, but throughout every heritage area in America, um, the history of these, they're oftentimes uh, what they would call the frontier military posts, right? Um, they were, uh, you know, this, this stretches all across the American West. And so they do have uh, very hard, uh, hard, uh, real history, right? It's not Disneyland history. It's like real hard. Uh, how do we, how do we talk about this stuff, right? So at Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park, that was the final uh, residence of uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer before he left to Montana and he never came back from Montana. Um, but so in, in just some quick backdrop, this doesn't make sense unless I give this quick backdrop, right? So in the 1980s, um, I was in elementary school, so I had no idea what was going on, right? But in the 1980s, there was a nonprofit group that coalesced into a Fort Abraham Lincoln Foundation. And they uh, marshaled uh, all sorts of resources to uh, eventually resurrect, resurrect and have built uh, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer's uh, officer's quarters at Fort Abraham Lincoln State Park. Because Fort Abraham Lincoln was uh, one of those interior military forts stationed on the Missouri River, which, of course, the Missouri River is the original main street of North America, right? Um, and they would uh, build these forts along these interior rivers so that they could supply troops to, as they used to tell us in the 1980s, to defend the railroad workers. And of course, um, they would use these things, they would defend the railroad workers. The question would always emerge in, in you, you know, a, a fourth grader's mind is like, well, who are they defending them against, right? Well, of course, uh, as John had um, eloquently talked about, um, this is the, the, 19, the long 19th century, right? Anyways, Jumping forward in the 1980s, the Custer House gets rebuilt, and it's called the Custer House. Um, you can call it the commanding officer's quarters as well of Fort Abraham Lincoln. But that happens in 1989 in uh, time for the uh, centennial of North Dakota for statehood, statehood, right? 1889 to 1989. Well, in 1989, Jumping forward to 2019, that's it has been 30 years since the, the commanding officer's quarters was rebuilt, right? So early on, uh, one of the state park um, staff had said, well, let's do the, you know, rebuilding the Custer House anniversary, a 30th anniversary. And right away with different partners, um, I had said in the meeting, I said, well, let's get away from calling it an anniversary, uh, first off, because that somewhat denotes uh, happy times, right? Let's call it a, figure out a better word, right? Observance. But right away, I think what the Northern Plains we, we did was we figured out how to scoop together actual monetary cash funds and um, start leveraging those funds to for outreach, uh, whether it was uh, appropriate honorarium for outreach for when tribal citizens would come to the table and say, hey, do you wanna help plan for this event, right? This, this 30th observance, um, the structure is there, right? We have to figure out what to do with it. Do you wanna help us plan this? And, and uh, it, it eventually turned into a Native Voices panel um, that was actually emceed by uh, Gerard Baker I don't know if anybody on the call here knows Gerard Baker or not, um, but Gerard was uh, a former superintendent at uh, Little Bighorn, um, when, especially when they're going through the name change from uh, the Custer Battlefield to Little Bighorn. Gerard Baker, Baker he actually had a, um, he's a tribal citizen of the MHA Nation, and he had a, a security detail attached to him eventually of some sort. I'm getting it mistaken here because um, he was getting threats, uh, whether death threats or not, from the from that name change from Custer Battlefield to Little Bighorn. Um, these these the people, uh, you know, with history and historical names, uh, it's very intense emotions, uh, as we all know, behind all this stuff, right? But anyhow, Gerard was uh, gracious enough or, or kind enough to our, our wanting to have um, we can't do this without native uh, tribal input, you know, and, and this being a centerpiece about to talk about what, what the Custer House meant in the past and what it meant in the future or, or meant in the present, right? Um, so there is, with the native voices panels, we got, let's see, Tamara St. John uh, from South Dakota. She's with Sistan Wapton Oyate. 
and she's also a, an elected representative in the South Dakota State House. Um, we got Lauren Yellowbird. Um, he took off his official National Park Service hat. He's the does a lot of interpretive, very awesome interpretive stuff at Fort Union. So Lauren Yellowbird is our Dakota Good House, Calvin Grinnell, um, and Donovan Sprague. And um, I could send out, I'll eventually I can send out a link of the Native Voices panel because we also not only were able to get those tribal citizens uh, honorarium, invite them and uh, make sure that their lodging was paid for. Um, but we also uh, collaborated and coordinated with, it was Justin Deegan's Thunder Revolution Studios, his own audio video tribal production company. And I said, hey, Justin, what, what better than uh, for us also to have resources to, um, if you want uh, to the Northern Plains to commission him to produce uh, uh, audio video narrative of, you know, uh, kind of an eight to 10 minute short of the native voices panels of the day. And he said, sounds awesome, man. Yeah, that sounds great. So it's just figuring out a way to put, uh, put the Northern Plains money where their mouth is and uh, use the actual tangible monetary resources to uh, put it back into um, collaboration with um, our tribal friends on the Northern Plains. And that, I just did really a case study. I didn't do, um, I didn't have as nice of a presentation, I guess, as well, John. So John, perfect. okay, yeah. Yeah, if there are any questions, I see it. I didn't look in the chat yet. I can look. Okay. Um, Peter shared a link um, to some some good content to read. Um, it is great. Um, actually, Aaron, I think it was excellent like to have a case study from an existing heritage area. Mm -hmm. And I think you're the first that I've heard um, giving um, funds to folks for their participation. So I think that's really helpful, um, honorarium. Um, are there others that do that on the call? With any partners, really? Peter, Peter is going to inspire my historiography brain to start saying, well, you got to read Pika Hamelina's uh, Indigenous Continent then uh, 2022, Peter, too. So uh, we can share bibliographies across email here. <laughs> well, John and Alex, thank you so much. I know all the hard work that went into your management plans. And Alex also mentioned that it was during COVID that you were trying to get that work done and how difficult it was for all of us to do our work and that you guys really positioned yourself well <clears throat> to get those management plans done. Um, so kudos to you for, for all the work, just this engagement, all the partnership engagement, um, just getting, literally getting them done and getting them approved is a huge accomplishment. Um, so do folks have questions? Just, you can go ahead and just ask. Actually, just to hop on to the question of, of payment, we did offer um, a couple TIPOs, so Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. We did offer them a stipend to help. Um, we had a, like a historical context statement in our management plan. So we offered a couple stipends to folks to help review that. Um, all of them turned it down and said like, no, this is part of part of our job to do this. Sure. Um, but we did offer. That's great. Um, Dan from Upper Housatonic said that they are working um, and developing a cultural liaison program. Anyone have an example outline of what a cultural liaison program agreement might look like? They're drafting it. And if anyone can share um, with Dan, that would be great. And Dan, yeah. if you want. Yeah, part and parcel of that. Thanks, Katie. Uh, part and parcel of that is we have a, a very robust ongoing relationship with the Stockbridge Muncie community, and we work together on a host of different projects. But most recently, we started talking about a cultural liaison program, and uh, we're not really struggling, but if there's examples of how this works in other areas, it would be so helpful to see that, to, 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 if anybody has a document to share. Um, and the other thing that we're working on that uh, I reached out to the National Park Service on, and I, I'm not sure there's quite an answer yet, but it would be helpful if anybody on this call today has any input is the uh, the notion of when we're working with the uh, the Mohican tribe 
on something involving intellectual property, for instance, a videotaping a presentation or recording something or publishing something, and how does using US government federal money with a sovereign nation's project, you know, where we're jointly working on something and then sharing the intellectual property rights or the right to publish and uh, what are the complexities there? And, and if anybody's ever worked through that um, and has any uh, insight, that would also be helpful. Um, I, I was actually on a call with their um, uh, their education uh, committee recently, and one of the people there that had been working on other projects said they they have examples of um, you know copyright or shared um, publication agreements. And so I, I've yet to see what one actually looks like. So if anybody has that too, that would be helpful. Thanks. Sorry, I hope I didn't stun you. No, no, I'm just, I'm trying to think about how to reply mm -hmm. to that too. But I think each heritage area, you know, each individual relationship is, uh, um, oh yeah, just get my map down here. I don't have to, I mean, I don't understand why people wouldn't want to look at that map all day or all week, but I get it. Yeah. Um, but um, I think, I you know, I think, I think just each heritage area and each individual relationship that we have, there are these, you know, kind of broad brushstroke themes that we, that we discussed through. And then there's these individual case studies, but it's just like, you know, it's, it's like, you just sit down and you, you, do, you, you come with an open heart and an open mind to any sort of conversation with whoever's the representative of the, the, you know, the tribal government and such. And I think you just start figuring it out. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, Dan, I'm not trying to say like, I don't, I could send you over the, the very structured, you know, uh, what does a liaison agreement look like? Um, but I, I think that sometimes is off putting on, you know, off putting to, to the process too. Like here, we're going to have a, we're going to develop a treaty. It's like, oh yeah, I've, I've been down this road. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we have historical studies of what treaties are all about. Right. I mean, well, the good part is we've already gotten to yes with them and they, cool. we like this idea. We jointly like this idea. Now we just need to put it on paper. What does it look right. like? Who has responsibility for what, how many hours is this person going to do? What is their compensation that flows? Who things of that sort? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And John, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to say, Dan, this is, it, I don't have a specific response to your reply other than it does, it, it sounds like if you're at yes, you've got to the critical, critical spot. So I was going to say, one of the things that we encountered that was a challenge was, remember our legislation said in consultation with, um, that's a government to government activity and we're not a government entity. So we, we, we learned a lot about big C consultation versus small c consultation and and trying to we tried to take advantage for its worth we tried to take advantage of we're not a government entity so we can't really consult with you but we can come in spirit of consultation and try to get things right so it sounds like you've gotten to yes on the principle of something and now there could be legal complexities of two sovereign governments trying to decide ownership of intellectual property but let the lawyers work that out underneath the underneath the agreement that you want to build with the, the tribe. Um, that proved to be a constructive space for us as we began to just have a better understanding and in the, the tribes too, because it was like confusing. It's like, are we, the, are, are, are we inserting ourselves into government, government relationships? No, we're not, but we're trying to, we're trying to create a, table where conversations that might be hard at a government to government context could be had so I yeah. know. and, and take, i think in that way advantage of of the uncertainty that's a creative space for you to try to figure it out with the tribe right and this is uh, actually the third time we've gone to tribal leadership with a proposal so the first two times very mm -hmm. successful we've gotten the outcomes that we saw so here we go again so this is you know we have a history of working well with them and uh 
they've asked, we've asked, um, you know, I guess we're going to code jointly draft some kind of working document, but I just thought if there's somebody out there that has a functional agreement already, uh, might speed that process along. But we've, we've gone before, as I said, uh, tribal leadership twice before, and they're familiar with the work we do, and we have earned that trust. So I, I absolutely agree with everything everybody's been saying today. Yeah, we we did have, for what is worth, for our planning process, Dan, we did have an MOU with one of the tribes. They They suggested an MOU would be helpful to just spell out the terms of our interaction. And, and, you know, it just says, how often are we going to meet? Who are the points of contacts? What do we, you know, how how and when do we involve tribal leadership or my board? Um, you know, it was it was kind of boilerplate, but it was also kind of custom to what are the things, what are the aspects of interaction we want to define? And that was, you know, that was helpful with that tribe. Other tribes didn't want it. And I think sometimes like from the park service standpoint, the big C, little C consultation, um, when a heritage area is designated as a federal commission, then I think the Park Service does take on a bigger role in that management planning um, and engagement. And sometimes tribal members are actually named specifically in the legislation as commissioners. So there is that formal nature. I think sometimes, you know, just if if and when it helps to have the Park Service help with consultation or, or you know, anything with a heritage area. Um, we try to be helpful. Um, sometimes we also get, try to get out of the way if we complicate things. Yeah, we're, we're, we've been consulting with uh, David Goldstein and Erica Chasson as well on this. And uh, the second, um, I think, major point is the Mohicans don't actually have any land here in the Upper Housatonic Valley anymore. Unfortunately, you know, their Wisconsin is thousands of miles from here. And so they welcome the work that we're doing because it's a connection to their ancestral homelands. And so they're they're actually very, very willing partners to have us work with them on outreach back here into the Berkshires. Hey, Logan. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, Logan Smith with the Appalachian Forest National Area, Jared. Uh, we have... Uh, we, we have no recognized tribal lands in uh, West Virginia. We have a lot of ancestral lands that, that some of the tribes uh, have uh, re uh, relationship to. We've reached out to a lot of the, um, those tribes that we've been able to identify and let them self-select as to whether or not they had an interest in our management planning process and interpretation and so forth. Uh, very little feedback. I know they've been busy, especially over the COVID years. But if anyone, and I don't mean to take up too much time answering this now, but if anyone has uh, any thoughts on how to interpret and and work with the um, with the ancestral uh, lands rather than the actual tribal lands that are that are that are functioning or or current, uh, or with any of the uh, with Seneca, Delaware, and and uh, Shawnee are the three major tribal uh, groups that we've reached out to. Joe Stallman with Seneca has been actively engaged with us. So that's been really useful and helpful. Uh, but we're also embarking on a, as part of the National Heritage Area, um, a storytelling grant. Recently, uh, we're going to be looking at maybe trying to tell that story of the ancestral uh, ties to uh, Native Americans in, in Western Virginia. Uh, so if anyone has any thoughts on this or would like to reach out to me, uh, please feel free to do so. Hey, Logan, some, it's really far afield, um, but there's a lot of really interesting um, work in Australia on back to the land efforts with Aboriginal people who have oftentimes been displaced since colonialism and trying to reconnect, um, sometimes for, for land management, um, land ownership, but even just the cultural tieback. So that, that might be a, a far afield case study to or set of case studies to to look at for a little bit of inspiration beyond our own borders yeah great thank you they, we've we've been lucky enough the mon forest uh, has been putting together a few uh, uh back to the homeland uh uh projects we've we had uh, some uh some uh groups come in from out of state and we actually had some just this past summer coming in to do some do some work and, and learn some things about their tribal roots. But uh, yeah, it, we, we have some resources, but uh, anything else, any, any 
strategies that anyone knows of to try and tell those stories in, in an appropriate manner and reach out to the other tribes uh, would be appreciated. Thank you. Sure. I think, um, sorry, just one other, I think the, I think Rainier National Park has just established an agreement with the Puyallup tribe to, to have them be more involved um, in the park. So there might be some, might be some things developing there. I just heard about that like last week, so I don't know much about it. Yeah. Hey, John, I like how you brought up the, uh, kind of the, situate this in a little bit of a global context with the analogy of of Australia <clears throat> and in some of you know another analogies to use in your presentation John you're saying well it's you know sovereign nations and they have contested land right and the analogies that I go through in my brain or come up right away is uh well France and Germany have uh, have also contested <laughs> lands through time and and of course the the big one that's uh really bright right now is uh uh, Russia in Ukraine, right? Uh, and of course, what does land mean for people? It means the ability to produce crops or to grow stuff so that you can sustain a culture. So these um, analogies like that are just, I think they're they're really good because it gets like, oh yeah, it is just like that, right? Or it is really similar to that. And suddenly you got the attention of somebody who maybe just fixated on Russia's invasion of Ukraine now thinking about exactly what was going on in the 19th century and where we at now today and in, in these sorts of conversations. So thanks for bringing up that, that analogy, the, the global analogy there. Was I getting too pedantic there? No. Was it really bad? If I, I was, I owe everybody a beverage, okay? <laughs> really yeah. know how to quiet a room, don't you? <laughs> I'll still take a beverage here. I will, okay, I will okay. too. <laughs> Just mark me down there in the chat. On there. Yeah. Um, I think these conversations are awesome and, you know, long overdue and, you know, more conversations like this um, needed. I, I do think this administration with Director Sams and Secretary Holland really presents um richer engagement and deeper conversations. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today and um, for our presenters. I, there was really wonderful information. Um, we could have just left the um, waterfall up. That was very serene. Um, <laughs> um, thank you all. And um, and thank you all for your collaboration. So if, if there aren't any other questions, then we'll say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Stay in touch, Katie. I will. Right. I got to come Thanks, get a drink Katie. from Aaron. So, you know. <laughs>